It's Friday the 13th. Should you be worried? Should you be worried about the economy, the Fed, mm. the markets, or Jason? <laughs> or, or, Jason or are we going to have a soft landing and you should just load up the truck with stocks? Mm. Well, that depends on who you talk to. So if you talk to Bar Chart, that charting company, they're bullish. They're very bullish. If you talk to Goldman Sachs, well, one person at Goldman Sachs, I'm sure they've got a couple analysts, some saying long, some saying short, so they can pull out whoever's right at the end of the year sure. and be right. But they're, one of their economists said it's, they're bearish for 2023, and they said the place to be is in T-bills. Because if you can make yourself 4 or 4.5% in short-term T-bills, why even take the risk in the stock market right, right now? Now, if you're hedge eye, uh, research firm, you're short, 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 man. You're going all in short. You think the market's crashing. If you're Jeff Gundlach, my man crush, a lot of big names that's what Tim used week. to accuse me of, having a, a, a man crush on Gundlach. Mm. Um, he's very bullish. just Tim. <laughs> all, right, uh, all, right, all right. All right. All right. All right. Anyway, uh, Jeremy Siegel, he's bullish. And when you ask him why, he said, well, because most economists are, are bearish. He said over 60% of the economists are all bearish and we think they think we're going into recession. And therefore, um, they're, because he knows, he's an economist himself, he knows the economists are almost always wrong. Mm. So he said, if they're all saying it's bearish, I'm bullish. I mean, that was his reasoning. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and so who do, you, who do you follow? Now, one reason I like Goon, Jeff Gunlock, the one reason I do like The him, one reason. Yeah. Is because actually all the other, I've tracked him for years, and all of the other economists, he's a bond money manager, are actually all over the place, scattershoot, and they, they're, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. It's just they're all, he is pretty consistent. He's usually pretty good. He's spot on. He's closest to just about anybody. Mm -hmm. And he gives his reasoning behind it. Okay. He was, a, he was the one last year at the beginning of the year said, we're going to see, inflation at eight percent he was way higher than everybody else he said look i missed it it was nine yeah i was only eight it was nine but everybody else was saying like four and five like i remember you telling and, me and he's the one that is now saying that inflation is going to come down faster than people think but anyway we're going to talk about that okay we're going to talk about what to do and which is more relevant to you ray j's 12 wishes like the, they they put this out at the beginning of the, every year after Christmas. It's like the twelve days of Christmas. Twelve wishes. They do their twelve wish list. That's ideal. So I'll give you number one right now. Where is that? The wish list. One year of peace and harmony. Okay. How does that help you oh, buy sure. stock, Don? Does that help you buy a stock? I don't know how that helps yeah, you. Yeah, I just I just hit the buy button based on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're now two hundred percent long. <laughs> anyway, uh, between he's saying between Russia and Ukraine, if things settle down and stuff, that that would be good, bullish for the market. Uh, thanks, genius. Uh, uh, that's their chief economist. At, <laughs> that's their chief economist at Ray J. That's giving you a pie chart. Anyway, um, um, so or so, do you want to go with with Ray J's twelve wishes for Christmas? By the way, they got, I mean, for 2023, by the way, they got slaughtered in 2022, mm. uh, big time. Or would you go with Gunlock's predictions uh, with the background and supporting data if, if, and I wince when I say that, if you're going to do a pie chart. Mm. But if you're going to do something like that, I'd kind of lean toward a, a Gunlock that's got a pretty good track record at, than these other guys that are scatter shooting all over the place. Okay? Then... We're going to talk about, and then annuities. I know you guys are sick of annuities, me talking about them, but I've been telling you for a couple of years now, they're coming for your, number one, they're coming for your money and your 401ks because they want you to annuitize it and keep the money and they'll just give you little payments of your big lump sum over your lifetime. And then when you die, they'll keep the big portion. It won't go to your kids. It's a great bit, isn't it? If you don't understand that, call me, but that's why you don't want to annuitize stuff. But normally, not always, normally. But are annuities, the, so even the regulators can't decide whether annuities are good or bad. So one is that they're Scary. way overused. They're, there's a lot of churning going on, a lot of commissions generated for the advisor, but they really aren't that good a lot of times. They're overused. But hey, we should put them in, in 401ks. And you know what? Now they're talking about, do we need to add layers of annuity purchases when you get in your 50s? 
close to retirement? Should you start adding annuity purchases to your target date funds, TDFs? They're known as TDFs, target. So, you know, the lazy man's 401k doing it is, oh, I'm retiring in 2040. I'm going to pick the 2040 fund and be done with it. Mm -hmm. Or the 2030 fund, because I'm retiring earlier, I'm older. And so that's going to be a little more conservative. Folks, if you put a, a, a chart of a target date 30 and a target date 40 fund, they move pretty, they're pretty, pretty well correlated. <laughs> There's not a lot of difference there. But anyway, so can we just admit that maybe target date funds themselves are the problem, not the annuity? Well, the annuities are a problem already. Right. So let's take a big problem and add a bigger problem into that smaller problem, and yes. then we'll fix the, the problem. The problem is coming from inside Yeah, let's the solve a problem with the problem. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, and, 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 and then we're going to get headlong into the markets and we'll go heavy duty into it. Okay, folks, listen, welcome to Your Money Radio. Uh, I'm your host, Danny Stewart. We got the whole t Revere team here, or Team Revere is one of the mailbags. Oh, and we're also going to do the mailbag. Oh, all right. Forgot about that. Five, five, okay. Full episode. So, so and, and, and we're going to go over that. And we're going to do a deep dive. Bo folks, by the way, if you've got a topic that you want to talk about, have us talk about on this show, good or bad, we'll be happy to talk about it. If you've got a question, you want a complimentary portfolio review, or if you really just want a stock or two talked about, like you're looking at something and you're not sure and you want some help, reach out to us. We'll be happy to put it in the mailbag and we will talk about that. All right. So, all right, let's get right into it first. Let's start with the annuities first because I can't stand them. So I want to get them out of the way. All right. So first of all, these, this is from the regulators. It's saying that these variable contracts are on the ra radar of the FINRA, the uh, financial regulatory industry, for good reason, because a rep can sell a replacement annuity, meaning you've already got an annuity, and so they're going to give you a bigger, better annuity, right, Zach? But uh -huh. there's a huge 8 or 10% front-end commission on it, and now you've got to surrender penalties for eight years, so it's like the Hotel California for at least a decade or eight years or six or whatever the surrender penalty may be, but now you've locked it in. And the problem is a lot of times it helps the advisor, it makes him money, but it really doesn't help you. So it says both FINRA and the best interest require that reps and advisors make sure that purchases or replacement of variable annuities is in the best interest of their customer. Mm. Thank you. That always should be that, in your that best interest. Yep. That should always be including the potential tax uh, penalties, various fees and costs, and market risk. Any switch must align with the customer's particular goals. Reps are also supposed to consider reason, reason, reasonable available alternatives. Uh, the best alternative, don't do the annuity to begin with. Um, uh, and then they said the reps have actually given insufficient consideration to reasonable alternatives to this recommendation. What does that mean in plain English? They stuck in the annuity. They had tunnel vision. You were always getting the annuity. They thought about selling you an annuity before you walked in the door and they knew your particular situation. Why? That's how they get paid. Follow the money. It's not that hard. All right. So now that we got that out of the way, that annuities are normally not worth the paper they're printing. I mean, there's some, <laughs> there's some times they're okay. They're not always, but... They're way, way overused. I would probably guess that 80% of them are unnecessary or there is a better solution. Yeah. And by the way, folks, in case you don't know, there are now new annuities that are fee-based only and commission, no surrender penalties. You can put the money in one day. You can take it out the next. And there are, but, but someone's got to manage it and look at it or you got to set it up with the pie chart to do what you want. But there are annuities that do that and they're very, very cheap. Why don't you hear about them? Because there's no big commission paid right. on it. The insurance agent can't make the big commission. So anyway, um, so, but remember what I told you a couple shows ago, and folks, you can go back. We don't, we archive everything. We don't take it down. I told you that the regulators are, are influenced by these huge lobbies like Vanguard, uh, uh, Fidelity, and, oh, you know, the people that create all the target date funds the BlackRock iShares, you know, all those. And they really want to keep your money in those 401ks. That's why they have this new DOL IRA rollover form you got to fill out, me as the advisor. So if I ever roll anybody's IRA from their 401k, I've got to justify it in blood, right? Sure. But also they want to add annuities into 
these 401ks so that you can start adding money into the annuities for lifetime income later. Now, the problem with that is usually you take a lump sum, let's just call it half a million bucks. You give that half a million bucks to the insurance company. They say, we're going to give you a lifetime income based on your age, your life, your life expectancy, and we'll give you $3,000 a month. And that's good. Fine. That's what I'm going to, it's going to supplement my social security. But, 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 but if I walk across the street and I'm jaywalking and I don't look and I walk in front of a bus and I get killed, that whole Whatever's left, you take three thousand dollars out a month. Say you've been into it for a year, so just around forty thousand dollars. Now it's not five hundred thousand; it's four hundred and sixty thousand. But you still got a nice little chunk there, right? Mm-hmm. If you get hit by a bus, that whole lump sum disappears. It goes to the insurance company. So the only way you win when you annuitize an annuity is if you live longer than your life expectancy by about three or four or five years. The only way you can win; otherwise, they win. And and it does give you some securities. I'm not saying they're all bad. All I'm saying is, but they definitely don't need to be added into 401ks as an option because you know what, folks? Listen to me very carefully. When you retire, you will be able to roll that into an IRA rollover, which is what they absolutely don't want you to. They want to keep it in the 401ks or because all these 401ks have these four or five big behemoth funds and most of them, Fidelity funds. Vanguard, et cetera. Okay. So they want to keep that money. Okay. But in that annuity that you can do, so you can roll it out into an IRA rollover and you can always annuitize it later. You can, an insurance company will always let you do an immediate annuity and give them a lump sum and they'll offer you a, a lifetime income or some kind of guaranteed minimum amount. Plus your heirs would get a little bit in case you die prematurely or, I mean, there's all different structures you can do, but you want to be able to control that. Not only that, you want to put it out to bid and you want to go to five different insurance companies and say, here's my half a million or 200,000. Who's going to give me the highest monthly income? Of course. Period. Yeah. Put it out to, well, Engage if you put it in the 401k, who, is, is there any competition? Who's doing that? Anyway, that's why, but, but there's no reason to put an annuity inside a 401k because the 401k is already tax deferred and bulletproof and creditors. So you're paying an insurance company, a nudie company, an extra 1% or 2% to tax defer something that's already tax deferred. In fact, 403Bs, teacher, the only thing 403Bs allow are mutual funds and annuities. So the government is really coming after these 401Ks saying these private companies are, you know, not treating their employees right when they're really screwing their government employees. Okay. But the whole point is you don't need an annuity inside a retirement plan. You really could use an annuity outside of it, if at all. I still don't like it that much. Okay. Anyway, if you have any questions about annuities, and by the way, we can, we've done these, we've had a few clients that had big capital. They either inherited an annuity from their mother or their deceased father, and they've got big capital gains, and it's income first, sorry, it's ordinary income first, return a principal second. So, the, so if you've got 200000 and now it's 400000 that first 200000 you take out is all taxable as income. That's why it's not really tax efficient. And that's why I don't like them. Okay? Really, the main reason you want to do an annuity is for asset protection. It's not for return. Their returns are not, it's, it's, that's not what you, don't let them suck you into that argument. It's really if you're a doctor and you're trying to protect some assets, you've got a high liability, fine. But if your family doesn't have a high liability, you really, it's really tough to make an argument to do an annuity with outside retire, of, of retirement accounts. All right. I think I beat that to death. So uh, I don't think there'll be any questions on that. These guys don't like annuities either, so they won't. <laughs> no, nobody's going to have any objections to what I said there, I don't, I don't think. All right. Now, so the next thing I want to do is I want to go over these predictions. I know I've talked about these predictions and whatever. Here are the, the 12 wish list from Ray J. Ray, R- Ray, Ray J. J. It's his 12 wish list. One year of peace and prosperity. Two million jobs created. Uh, 3% core inflation. Gas prices below $4. It already is in Texas. Uh, five golden rings. What he's saying there is he hopes that the price of gold comes down a little bit. Oh, and so, it's also yeah, a pun. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, a come, and, a, and a comeback for the 60-40 portfolio. 
because that got slaughtered last year, worst return ever for it. Uh, mortgage rates below 7%, because right now they're about 8.5, starving nothing. Dividend growth of 8%. Nine doves on the Fed, so he wants everybody on the Fed to do a, 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 a group hug and start lowering rates and flooding the market oh, with money. Yeah. He wants the Fed to save them. Lower, a lower, less volatile 10-year yield. All 11 sectors in positive territory. And the NASDAQ reaching 12,000. Well, that's it. That's all we got to do. We don't have to worry about that. All right. Now, so that was, that was one guy's uh, wish list. Jeremy Siegel, I told you, is positive just because all the economists are bullet, bearish, right? Sure. So now I'm going to give you Goonlock. Yes. My man crush. Your man. <laughs> uh, I, I'm you, you said it. I, I actually like that. He's actually a good, you know what? He's not like your traditional Wall Street guy. You know, you, they, they roll out these guys on Bloomberg and CNBC, sure. and they all say it's the same mantra. It's all, he's kind of the, the lone, he kind of goes out there and speaks his own mind. He used to be in a rock band when he was like in his late oh, 18, stop. 19, 20, 20. Whoa. He was in a punk. You can go look his, Did he have a fan he, there's club? some old YouTube videos you? of him being in a punk band. It's hysterical. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, and he just tells it like it is. Anyway, so let me give you a couple things here. So he is saying that, um, um, he said, here's his nine market economic predictions. Remember, last year, he was the most accurate out of all of them, okay? Fed rate height to 5%, not happening. He said the U.S. Treasury curve implies the Fed won't raise interest rates to 5%, currently at 4.25 to 4.5 range. Despite the signals from some central banks, he goes, I don't think they'll surpass that mark. He said, it's pretty obvious the Fed is not in control. The bond market is in control. For roughly 25 years, the Fed has followed the two-year treasuries, which sit below the current Fed funds range lower band at 4.24. That's unusual. Okay. He said he expects the, the, the Fed to raise once again in February, likely 25 basis points. but the bond market suggests that it may not go higher than that number. That would not surprise me at all. So that is completely kind of contra what most other people are saying. I have been on this podcast for the last three months saying that the Fed's going to say uncle sooner rather than later. I agree with them because things are starting to slow pretty good. He said the Fed is going to ease, say the bond market. I'm sorry. The Fed is going to ease, says the bond market, more than the Fed says they're going to ease. So he's saying the bond market is telling us they're going to get dovish. Uh, he says he thinks the, the Fed funds will peak in May or June at 4.93. Don, write that down, 4.93. We want to know what that's going to look like in, in, in a few months. Now, a, a 40-60 bond portfolio is the new 60-40. That's kind of unusual. So what he's saying here, he said bonds are attractive. So bonds got slaughtered last year. Folks, if you didn't know, bonds had their worst year ever last year. Now, there was a time between 1977 and 1979 that bonds fell as much, but they did it over a two over a annual calendar cutoff, right? Sure. So it wasn't in one year. Well, this year, this was the word, and that goes back 97 years since they've been keeping records. Anyway, he said the current uh, market conditions uh, call for a major adjustment in the traditional 60 stock, 40 bond portfolio toward uh, 60 bond and 40 stock. And what basically what he's saying is, look, with the Fed easing interest rates and peaking and bonds already gotten slaughtered, we're setting up for a, a nice bull run in bonds. That's what he's saying. He said the bond market is demonstrably cheap to the stock market. And I recommend a 60-40 portfolio, but flipped to bonds to stocks. Uh, bond allocations will Just be to more. Clarify, he's a bond salesman, right? Oh no, no, no! I'm, I'm getting that. No, I was going to say. Now there is a conflict of interest because he's a bond salesman. <laughs> so that extra twenty percent on uh, how many people are investing in America? Probably 150, 200 million. That makes him a little chunk of change here. Sure. Um, so he does. He does. Yeah, he does like bonds. But I will say this, Don. You got to give him credit because he has come out when he is bearish on bonds, and he will tell you bear, bonds are not. They're going to hit a rough period. Mm -hmm. And my bond fund is not going to, I mean, I don't know other managers that will actually come out and tell you that bonds are going to go down and That's his fund's thoughtful. probably going to struggle. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is interesting for us, Don. International stocks will become the new equity leaders. Uh, tremendously favors international 
over U.S. equities, including Europe, but especially emerging markets. He recommends zero U.S. stocks. I do not agree with that. Okay, the U.S. has been a world leader, noting that the MCI uh, U.S. index handily beaten the USI world XUS for five years. I think that trend is going to be reversed. Now, four, the falling dollar will make emerging market stocks more attractive. From 2010 to 2022, U.S. stocks showed monumental outperformance to EM stocks. That's unusual. While U.S. equities aren't as overvalued to e emerging market shares now as they were at their recent peak, he still thinks the emerging markets is more favorable. Uh, underpinning this is Gunlock's expectation that the U.S. dollar is headed lower. He thinks we've got a weaker dollar. And the deficit will likely expand in this recession. EM stocks, emerging market stocks aren't ch as cheap as they were a few months ago, but they have a good tailwind. So basically, he's thinking that a couple, month, a couple weeks ago might have marked uh, a bottom. Okay. Now, he said almost all signs point to recession. And folks, don't get confused with this. As, remember, we've said this. The market will actually start selling off before you enter a recession, and it will start rallying before you come out of the recession. So the market will actually front run the economic stuff. So this actually lines up. It's not, it, it seems counterintuitive on the surface, but it actually makes sense if you've been around long enough. Okay. So he said the, uh, let's see, what, what was it? Underpinning gun, explain the dollar's headed lower. Okay. Almost all signs point to recession. He said the U.S. employment rate, the last man standing in terms of the parts of the economy that people can look to be bullish on, on the economy, uh, uh, might cross its 12-month moving average in the next few months. Uh, that's a strong indication we're, we're on the front edge of a recession. So what he's saying is the job numbers are starting to, unemployment starting to go up. He said the leading economic indicators are now negative, at a, now at negative 4.5 year over year. That six-month number annualized is even worse at 7.3. He said heading sharply into recession territory. Once you've got negative year over year, he said, there is no scenario historically that a recession was avoided. So he's saying if the leading economic indicators are negative for 12 months total, it's 100% there's a recession. Now, we're already into it by about eight months. So we got a few more months. Quite frankly, I think we're already in a recession. Uh, if you go by the classical definition, which they changed once we actually had two negative quarters of GDP, they said, well, that's not really the real definition. So everybody's still arguing about that, I guess. Um, uh, let's see. Obviously, the yield curve is screaming recession. The second half of the year, uh, uh, let's see, actions. In the second half of the year, the three-month to the 10-month became inverted. He's talking about last year. Uh, it's very inverted, the 210. So that's what he's looking at. Now, dodging a recession is possible but unlikely. He is saying that a high yield, you know, here's the other thing that is not, is not flashing recession, the other indicator. He said a key, the key high yield market spread, the high yield versus treasuries or high yield versus investment grade, it normally gets wider when more people are worried about recession because high yield bonds are more speculative stocks with convertible bonds or high yield bonds. They're more speculative. And so when people worry about speculative stocks not making it, now you're worried about just getting your money back, right? You're getting about your principal back, not the interest. So the, they start going down in price and when people start selling high yield bonds and moving into investment grade bonds, that spread widens. And that has not happened. And he said, um, um, he said uh, the high yield market spread is elevated, but nowhere near recession levels. If you want to argue against a recession, that would be one of your better arguments. He said, maybe this time the high yield market will sit this one out as being a recession indicator, or maybe the high yield market is right. So if you want to be an anti-recessionist, you've still got the labor market kind of working for you, which I think the numbers are a little cooked, but, uh, and you've got the message of high yield uh, market spread is working for you, but that's about it. Everything else is, 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 is pointing toward recession. Seven, consumers won't save the economy. We're starting to see the consumer getting much worse, much more stressed out with the Fed tightening and the lack of government money. 
Housing affordability has collapsed to its lowest level since 1990, and consumers are racking up credit card debt. So they were saving during COVID, and now they're, they're, they're start spending on the credit cards again. Housing is not rescuing the economy in 2023. Although Goonlock doesn't expect a rash of mortgage defaults because credit quality on those loans are higher and housing prices ha- have risen substantially. So they've got a buffer there. They've got some equity in the house, even with a 20% correction or whatever. Uh, meaning the U.S. Sa- so meanwhile, the U.S. savings rate has dropped dramatically to its lowest since the run up during the 2008 financial crisis. So it won't provide a, a safety net. Okay. Consumers don't have the money. We see all kinds of evidence. Consumers having to dip into their credit card to support the basic spending on necessities. Uh, That's not a sign of consumer confidence. They're desperate rather than happy. Okay, gold is good. This is number eight. Gold has been good in dollar terms lately. uh, And in in non-dollar terms, meaning if you're in euros or yen, it's even better. It's been better for longer. He said, I think this is a reasonable, reasonably good time to buy gold. And again, this is from a Gabon guy. Uh, then the, 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 and the precious metals is above its 200-day trading, uh, trading average and will benefit from a weaker dollar. Nine, risk assets will have a reasonably good first half of the year. So real yields have stopped going up. That's good news for riskier assets. It's unlikely to rise in the and are and yields and are unlikely to rise in the first half of 2023. He said that's one headwind that has been taken away from risky assets. Um, um, that and he's saying that's why risky assets are starting off the year reasonably well. The S and P forward price to earnings ratio was very sensitive to the 10 year Treasury. Uh, watch the real yields. That's good news. It's less than a headwind. So he's basically saying because the yields are stopping rising, that's going to be bullish for stocks. Okay. Mm. Oh, oh, and so his his actually on on one of these other articles he did, he was saying it's not even the twenty, uh, you know, that reverse sixty forty sixty bonds forty stocks. He even had a portfolio where he was saying, uh, where was it sixty thirty five fifteen or, or twenty five fifteen or something, having a little cash just to be safe. In any event, if you're going to do a pie chart, which we don't subscribe to or believe in here or, 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 or like it, but sometimes with 401ks, with lots of restrictions or lots of problems, you, you got to do what you, what you're, what you're, the hand you're dealt. So if you're having to do something longer term and not able to move stuff around as much, you probably want it. We, and we've already done this in 401ks that we manage. We manage outside 401ks that only have mutual fund options. <clears throat> we've got bond exposure. Uh, and we've increased our stock exposure. <clears throat> and we have less cash than we did. Now, that can change, but that's uh, very good. So anyway, all right. Uh, with that backdrop, now I want to go over. Oh, we got the mailbag first. I wanted to go over the... Uh, uh, Revere, but first, do you have any comments on any of that, Don? While he's drinking, I picked out Robert. He's taking you a big drink. Like a waiter to ask walking question. up while he's taking a bite. <laughs> well, my first question is, Dan, what do you call uh, that small thing that holds bullets that you hold in your hand? Uh, what do you call that? Protection? No, pistol? A gun? No, a gun. Yeah, but why don't you call it a goon? I give up. Do you see what I'm getting at? No, I have no idea. I see what you're getting at. His name is Gunlock, but you continue to call him Goonlock. Goonlock, Goonlock, Beckensy, Deutsch, hair, hair, uh. Gun instead of a goon. I like, I like Goonlock. If you got a German pistol, would you call it a goon? Is that, is that? Uh, No, I'd call it a Mauser. Okay. Uh, anyway, so, um. Let's go. Okay. So let's go into the uh, mailbag. Yes. Okay. Because we did. And folks, again, if you've got questions or you got a stock you want us to, to, to look at, uh, let us know and we'll bring it up. A couple of, uh, I think actually all three of these are not only loyal. Li- oh, there's one that's not a client and the other three are clients. Okay. Hello, Dan and Don. First, let me say I'm very happy with the job you've been doing in this very treacherous market environment. 
This is why I chose your firm. Thank you for the kind words. I want to throw out a stock idea for your consideration. It's a Ray, A-R-R-Y. That's the ticker, A-R-R-Y. I'm sure it's come up on your screens before because it's an excellent fundamentals. It has excellent fundamentals and can slim characteristics. I think it's about done with its current early stage base, first stage base, Friday and and let's and then Friday had last Friday had a beautiful shakeout bar that closed in the top third of its range. Just an idea for your consideration. Uh, Dan, by the way, thanks for the rub you sent for the Christmas letter. Uh, I'll be using it on summer camps with my son. Can't wait. Thanks, JB. Uh, this was Don's answer. Hi, JB. Thanks for reaching out and the kind words. It, it's been a really tough market. Array is one of the solar stocks we actively monitor, but it has an ATR, that's average true range, of 8%. That means its daily range fluctuates 8%. You got a tiger by the tail there. On which, average. Average, average, right. Average, so that means it can average. go. So if the average is eight, folks, that means sometimes it's four, but sometimes it's 12. Double digit. Anyway, um, which makes it extremely volatile and tough to handle in this market. This is quite a shakeout on 1.6, and its trading range on that day was over 19%. Yikes. The 20 level is acting as resistance currently. Thanks again. Don, you want to pull that up? Oh, you already did. Okay. So you want to just quickly say any comments on that, Don? Yeah, I sent my reply back here yep. on the 10th when right. 20 was resistance. It had a great day on the 11th, up 9%, uh, and followed up the following two days. So uh, he absolutely found an excellent stock in a great sector. The, the wide ATR leads us to shy away from it. And because the sector's acting well, there are some others in there that we would be focused on ahead of that. Um, I'll bring up a couple of tickers. Sedge, not quite as volatile, also forming a, a nice base. First Solar, which seems to have gotten rid of all of the sellers and is uh, putting in a similar pattern. We're looking for a handle in here. This is probably number one on our list to get into. Uh, on the other hand, Enphase, a former leader, broke the 200 day moving average and is now just getting back above it and finally uh csiq canadian solar uh, another one that looks very similar to array but also another one with a very wide atr so right sector right stock if you can size it correctly and not get shaken out on a normal day meaning you absolutely need a low risk entry point uh to combat that around the 20 area would have been uh, a decent low risk entry point. Now it's uh, extended up here near 23. Okay. I got two questions. First, go back to the one, two ago, the one that broke down and broke. It's just now clearing above the 200 day. Yeah. Former leader end phase. Yeah. Okay. Now question, because I know people are asking this because they're visually looking at those charts and going, ah, oh, look at those other four. They already went through the, to the moon. They're already way extended. They're already way up. Shouldn't I bottom fish and pick this? And I'm not saying you don't or do. What I'm saying is if the whole sector is, is, is shaping up and really starting to run and that one had a big hiccup and maybe just turning the corner, would you pick that one breaking through the 200 day versus one of the other ones that, it, that it, they're, they're all at the higher end of their range? The L in CanSlim stands for leaders, not laggards. And that pretty much answers the question. This okay. is a laggard. The other nicer charts that we showed are leaders. It's a matter of finding the leader at a low risk entry point. Don, you just wrote some of my script for the newsletter. Leaders, not laggards. I like that. All right. Second one. Leaders, not laggards. Second one. I want you to quickly, very quickly go over the uh, Reva. What are you? We call it the Reva, the, the Revere when you're doing the position sizing. Volatility uh, adjusted beta. Yeah, yes. this is something that we that we developed uh, in house. Yeah, starting in in February 2021, when the markets continued to look fine, but under the surface, growth stocks uh, were breaking down left and right and breaking down a lot. So if you went by what the indexes were doing to gauge your exposure to the market, you were missing what was going on under the surface. So we added an ATR component, which we talked about with Array, 
uh, and combined uh, that with, so 80% ATR and 20% beta, comparing those to the S&P 500, and we give every uh, prospective ticker a score. And the total of those scores totals the RVAB that I show in the tail of the tape every night. That's volatility adjusted beta. So you can revere, have revere volatility adjusted. Revere volatility okay. adjusted beta. You can have uh, 20% uh, exposure in your portfolio, but that could really be the equivalent of 50 or more percent exposure, depending on what stocks you're holding. So if you're holding a portfolio full of CMG, type names, then yeah, they move slow and uh, you're probably closer to, to the uh, a 20% beta. But if you're holding a bunch of high flyers, like I said, you could be up to 50 or 60%. So could volatility hard. adjusted beta gives us a better handle on um, exactly how risky our portfolio is. Yeah. And let me put my Don Terpeter on that real quick. So, so what he's saying is, say you wanted 10 stock, you're, 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 invested you've got 10 or 12 stocks so that one stock doesn't cream you if they're cooking the books or doing something you don't know about right so you don't just have two or three stocks rather than picking five percent of every stock like 20 stocks at five percent right the stocks some stocks are a lot more volatile and move differently so you think that well i got five percent the same position size they're all equivalent if one is twice as volatile, it has twice the impact on the portfolio. So when you use this Revar, we will adjust the position size so that one month. Revab, oh, not yeah. re Revar. <laughs> you can't call it whatever you want, Dan. Revab, Revab. Like Gunlock and Dunlock. Yeah. RVAB. All right. So, <laughs> but but so if you have a a so the position size is maybe three and a half, maybe four, maybe five. But the effect to the overall position, the portfolio is the same. So it standardizes d different stocks. So they, in other words, if you hit your, your maximum stop loss, if you got a stop loss in there, it's only going to have a negative 0.2% negative effect on the total portfolio. So each position, even though some are more high flyers and more volatile and some are more docile, now they are kind of made equivalent in the portfolio. And it's how you manage risk. All right. And it's also critical if you if you have a stock with a 10 percent um, uh, RVAB ATR. or ATR mm -hmm. and you think you're going to set a 2 percent stop on it, you're just setting yourself up for getting stopped out. Yeah, you'll just get whipsawed. Yeah. If it's, so if, what he's saying is if you've got a 2 percent, if you've got a 10 percent average true range, your stop loss has to be at least more than 10 percent because otherwise you're going to you'll you'll stop it out in just one average trading day. It'll get stopped out. In normal volatility. Yeah. In, in normal volatility. Yeah, normal volatility. So you make that stop loss maybe 12 or 4, whatever it is, but then you make the position size maybe a third of what a normal, quote, conventional stock position size would be. And therefore, even if you get stopped out at 12%, the dollar hit to the portfolio is the same. Okay. Does everybody understand? Right. Folks, if you, if you guys have any questions on that, email me at dan at revereasset.com and I'll explain that. That's very important when managing risk and it really has helped us improve our process. All right. Good morning, Danny. On a recent podcast, Team Revere, I like that. I like, instead of Revere Team, Team Revere. The, the Revere Team, I like Team Revere. Yeah, I like All calling right. it the shop. But good, good morning. Well, the shop, yeah. yeah. Good morning, Danny. On a recent podcast, Team Revere discussed the following stocks. TMDX and ISRG. Since uh, then, both experienced a pullback and Revere sold the one position. They appeared to have been stabilized, to have stabilized. TMDX is showing strength. Does Revere have a bullish or bearish consensus on these two stocks? Regards, Jay. You know why Jay, I know he's a client? Because he knows, he say, he's asking do you guys, is this stock showing it's bullish or bearish based on the charts? To you, is it looking, in other words, we don't, we just interpret what the market's saying. We don't really, we don't know what, the, we just follow what the charts are telling us. So I said, Jay, thanks for the question. This will make the mailbag this week's show, Danny. So Don, what's your answer on those two? Uh, can you go to the charts? TMDX. 
Well, first, intuitive surgical. Okay. Uh, and the reason why we brought this up in the same uh, breath as TMDX is because this was a, this is going back years, but, uh, and if we go to a monthly chart of this, you can see how it made its big run. This really, over 16 years ago, started to become very mainstream in hospitals before it was virtually unheard of. Uh, but they have this Da Vinci system that has revolutionized uh, certain types of surgeries. Uh, TMDX, on the other hand, is also just emerging, but they've got a revolutionary way to keep uh, to keep organs alive while waiting for transplant. The the failure rate normally they just pack them in ice and ship them off and and hope they hold, but uh, Alex explained this, and he, he said that the failure rate for organ transplants is unacceptably high. But uh, TMDX has developed a process to keep the organs alive while they're waiting for transport. Uh, TMDX, we held it for a while. This was while the market was correcting. It was holding up. Uh, but then it had this big down day, which was kind of a huge shakeout. But it broke our rule, broke the 21. Uh, broke below the 50 and the slope of the line rolled over so we stopped out of it since then along with the market correcting you can see this black line here that's saying the s p is going back up no surprise that tmdx is going back up also we definitely have this on our watch list one of the problems with this is that it only trades 365,000 shares a day and it's a 60 dollars stock uh, so it's somewhat illiquid and more difficult for us to get in with uh, our client base, but it, it is uh, on our list. We may take another step and uh, we do like very much the story and the long-term prospects for it. Right, right. So if you're an individual investor and you're doing it yourself, this is definitely a candidate that should be on your watch list. But if you decide to own it here, I mean, this this recent area where it shook out, the lows were all around the 54 area. If it would break this area, it's an absolute sell. That means there's something either wrong with the market or wrong with the stock. Okay. And TMDX? So about oh. so about 10% down. That's TMDX. Oh, that, that, that so is TMDX. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So, Jay, I intuitive, hope. Uh, intuitive. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, I talked about intuitive, intuitive surgical, but I didn't give my technical opinion on it. Uh, this is an avoid because it's below the 50 day moving average and the slope of the 21 has rolled over. Uh, it is near support here at 250, uh, but we don't buy stocks once they've uh, rolled over and broke uh, the 50 day moving average. So, where would you buy it? If What would it have to do to make I would you wait buy for it? It would need to, to go sideways. The 21 day would need to catch back up to price and start to turn back up and price would need to get back above the 21 and the 50. Okay. They All do right. have a learn, uh, earnings in two weeks. So um, that might be a catalyst for getting back in it. As last time it uh, announced earnings, it gapped up uh, 9% on heavy volume. And that's what kicked off this latest run. We, you know, if we got in on that day, on that gap up day, which we wouldn't have because we generally don't buy stocks below the 200 day moving average. Uh, but this is one that broke back above it, back tested it, and then uh, had a nice little run. Uh, but it did obey the 20 day moving average, the 21 day exponential moving average very nicely during this run up. And then um, you could have, if, you, if you'd have bought it here around 220, uh, when it broke below the 21 here around 260, you could have booked uh, some very nice profits. Okay. All right. Now, let's see. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Mer he said this one to Merrill. Good afternoon, Merrill. Aww. Happy New Year. Hey, hello, uh, Merrill. He said, uh, he said if, if, if he was still on the team, I would ask Tim. My question relates to something he used, uh, and I'm searching for an insight. That's what we do in our daily market insight video, an insider podcast where Tim explained how to trade using the five and eight EMA, but I cannot find it. Would you have any idea where to find it? Uh, my answer was, I do not know specifically which video, but, but here's the bottom line. When the five exponential moving average, that's a super, super uber short term uh, technical indicator. It's only five days. So, and the today and yesterday has much more weight than five days ago. That's only one fifth. Okay. So, if it starts hooking up and cutting, slicing through the eight exponential moving average, that means very, very uber short-term momentum is crossing over short-term momentum. 
And so the odds of having uh, that stock go up in price over the next just couple days, it's very short term, is, is, is pretty good. So how you would use that, number one, if you're doing options and you're looking to buy in options because options move more than the stock, you could buy a call on that pretty quickly as soon as you see that taking place. Or another thing is if you're actually tracking a stock and you're looking for an entry point, like you're, there are other things that are setting up and you like it, and now you're just trying to find a good entry with and other uh, technicals look pretty good, that would be a good entry point because it gives you a g- higher probability of getting a little bit of a gain in the short term to give you a buffer so you can ride out. It's easier to ride down a, ride out a pullback. Because remember, if we buy a stock and it breaks out, if it goes up immediately pretty quick and we're up 5 or 10% on it, we can give that stock more room than if we buy a stock and it goes down to 4% right away. It's negative 4% right away. Now we're on you know, stopwatch alerts to, to, to minimize losses. So it makes it harder to hold through that. So that's why it, if, if, you, if you use that, it might help you to be able to hold positions. It really is just a very, very short-term indicator. It's for short-term trading. It's not really uh, that long-term. And finally, the last one, um, I, and I, I'm not quite sure what this to make of it. I was trying to remind the queen, you, and I think that means his wife. I was trying to mind, remind the queen, you say people shouldn't ask their advisor about an, oh yeah, about an exit strategy. I'm already on board with you guys and the way you handle things. Just wanted to help to educate others so I can send them your way. Thanks, Jim. Um, anyway. Uh, well, thank you for the kind words, Jim. I appreciate that. And you should always ask your advisor, what is your exit plan or what is your sell discipline? What would make you buy? What would make you sell? Yeah, where are the fire if you do buy and hold for a long time, you're not actively managing all the time. Are you going to do tax loss harvesting at the end of the year? So I minimize my taxes. We don't have to worry about that at Revere normally because we're, we're, keeping losses small to single digit for the most part, and we keep them quickly. So we've already got any losses that we might've accumulated for the year. They're already booked. We don't have to worry about, they're not unrealized. They're realized and they're single digit. They're not unrealized down 25% or 20%. Okay. So there's a difference, but if you do use someone that doesn't sell very much, you definitely need to do uh, some uh, uh, loss harvesting. And if they don't have rules, that's more random. Now you're making it random. Now it's not, you're leaving it up to the markets and sequence of returns. All right. Enough said. That's, that was our mailbag. Again, folks, if you got any stock you want us to talk about or review, please send us an email and we'll be happy to do that. And without further ado, let's go to the Revere, Team Revere. Yeah. And let's go to uh, the markets and Don and let's let him, let the team tell us what they're seeing and what they're looking at. and. Is it time to buy? Is it time to sell? Or is it time to stand pat? Don? Sure. Uh, so CPI was was the big event this week that uh, needed to be watched. And that, that came out on Thursday morning. That was the latest inflation data. Um, and the market the video that i did wednesday night said did the market just front run cpi because normally uh markets just kind of wait for a big binary event to come out and then react accordingly but the last couple of cpi reports the market made a big move higher the day before so two cpi reports ago it was up 1.3 percent uh this CPI on Wednesday, it was up 1.28%. So the question I asked in the heading of the video was, did the market just front run CPI? And uh, the answer was maybe, I guess. Uh, we ended up, it ended up working out for them, but it very easily uh, could not have. The numbers came out in line exactly. There's four key numbers. There's core and there's headline, and then there's the year over year, and there's the monthly. All four of them exactly met expectations, and there was extreme volatility before the market opened, 
That volatility carried over to the first 30 minutes of the market on Thursday, uh, but it ended up resolving to the upside. So the bears won that day on Thursday. So anybody that got in early uh, and tried to ride that higher, uh, if they didn't get stopped out early in the day, they ended up making money if they jumped in early that Wednesday before. So the bulls won. Uh, fast forward the bulls to today. The Bulls won, right, and that was the title of Thursday night's video. So uh, today's video, uh, we gapped down this morning by 0.75% uh, because bank earnings came in. I don't know if they came in weak, they came in mixed, but the outlook, the it doesn't matter what the interpretation was. What matters is the response to it, and the response was that they all gapped down in the morning, but they've since recovered along with the market here's a five minute on the s p 500 you can see the gap down you can see them recovering uh contrast that with jp morgan which is one of the banks that reporting you can see the massive gap down and the even stronger recovery and it's now above thursday's highs so what was initially uh, uh an open the day by selling banks and selling off the market has transitioned into buy the dip and by the dip has been working over the last week, uh, but by the dip works until it doesn't. And that's why we always raise our stops as the market uh, progresses higher. So um, anytime you see a candle where it closes at the top of the range, that meant that all the dips during that day were bought on the pullback. That happened Tuesday, it happened Wednesday, it happened Thursday and it's happening today. So that's a big plus for the bulls if you're trying to determine the strength of the overall market. Uh, each one of those days we opened down, we finished higher, putting in what's called a, a, a hammer candle, meaning that your close is near the high of the day and you shook everybody out near the lows. So four straight of those, the market's a little bit overbought, but the important thing is that the reaction of the bulls has been positive the last four days and that carried over after the CPI report. The next big event is going to be the Fed meeting on February 1st. Uh, based on CPI yesterday, the odds are over 95% now that they're going to raise by a quarter point and then supposedly another quarter point and then they're going to be done uh, is what the Fed futures are pricing in right now. The big question now is can we get above this big ugly black line? That's the 200 day moving average on the S&P 500. And that has capped the progress of the market every time we've touched it going back to uh, August. August, we hit it, pulled back hard. We hit it again in late November, pulled back a little bit, tried to get above it again. On the last CPI report, pulled back again. Uh, now we're trying to get back above it again. Uh, however, there's very positive numbers in the in the market that are showing more strength, more underlying strength than you would see in the two big indexes that we track, which are the NASDAQ 100, which has very clearly lagged. We've talked about that this year. That's because those big FANG type stocks continue to get uh, sold off. And if you look at QQEW, which is the equal weighted version of those, it's already above the 200 day moving average. If you look at the equal weighted version of the S&P 500, it's absolutely over uh, the 200 day moving average. So equal weighting has paid off those big tech stocks that are weighing down the tech component of the S&P 500 because it's the heaviest weighted component and also dragging down obviously the NASDAQ 100, which is a tech heavy index. Uh, the equal weights are saying, don't worry so much about those, but everybody and their brother is keeping an eye on this 200 day moving average on the S&P 500, because that's been the story going back uh, all year last year, is that any rally had been capped by the S&P 500 into the 200 day moving average. And since 70 to 80% of stocks in direction, uh, with the overall markets, especially the S&P 500, uh, it certainly pays it, it uh, bodes you well to pay attention to what that's doing. So the bull case here is to get above 4,000 and hold above 4,000. Any pullback uh, should be bought, very similar to the way pullbacks were bought over the last four days in the market. And uh, that's a feather in the cap for the bulls. And at some point, if we start to really spike higher, the bears will have to cover. 
uh, their shorts, that'll propel the market higher. Uh, and then you monitor the next pullback. Does it hold 4,000? And if it does, is the slope of the line to the 200 day moving average starting to flatten out? And if it flattens out and starts to turn up, that's another feather in the bull of the cap, uh, in the cap of the bulls. And we also want to get to see these other shorter term moving averages come back above the 200 day because they haven't done that going all the way back to March and April of last year. So it's just a matter of monitoring the price of the S&P 500 versus the various moving averages. Once we get above one, we always start putting money to work. We get back above the 50, we put more money to work. If we get back above this 200 day moving average, we'll put even more money to work. So it's progressive exposure. Uh, if these fail, we break back below the 21 day moving average and the 50 day moving average will be out with at most about a 2% loss to the overall portfolio. And that's how we manage things. And those are the keys that we're watching uh, going forward into next week. All right. Well, man, that was, that was a mouthful. All right. So what are the, what are the, what, what uh, sectors and stocks does the, the team have? Let's go to Connor first. Uh, he's going to discuss five. We, we have sector assignments within uh, everybody on the team. That means they just dive a little bit deep. They're not, you know, they can look at everything in the market, but they're expected to know a little bit more about uh, some stocks in their individual sectors and certainly be the first to bring them to our attention as a team uh, if they start acting well or if there's a change in character and they start acting worse. So we can focus on a uh, market, then sector, then stock uh, basis on what's working and what's not working. So, Connor, you want to go ahead and start? Yeah. <clears throat> um, the first one, if you want to pull up GEO. Um, so this one, I talked about it previously, but this is one of the best looking REITs that I'm seeing. Um, when you compare it to its peers in the sector, it, it has the best relative strength. So price action is, is showing it's the best. And um, like we talked about last podcast, it came down. We were talking about gaps a little bit, and this came down to test that uh, gap a little bit. And as you can see, price like dipped down below it a little bit, but came back right away. So definitely a positive, and now it's kind of building the right side of its base just under its highs. Um, so it looks a lot more actionable now because <clears throat> as we've seen this year, like if you're trying to buy gap ups right away, you can get punished, and um, this market's pretty volatile. So buying the gap up right away usually isn't in your best interest. Um, the next one is BKNG. Um, I talked about this one again two podcasts ago. Uh, it was right when it was right around the 200-day moving average. So as you can see, um, when, once it got over the 200-day, it, it's it's just exploded higher. It's uh, around 16% from that 200-day moving average. Um, and really the story with a lot of these has been all the, uh, <clears throat> the pent-up demand from China and all that. So all these, you know, leisure travel booking names have, have seen a very nice move. And what we want to see now is I've, we're seeing some breakouts, but now we need to see these names tighten up on the right side and digest this move a little bit. And then and when you look at the volume as well, I mean, that's, that's a lot of accumulation volume going on. Uh, next one's a new one. It's CPRI. Uh, this is this is a apparel retail name. These names have been really hot lately as well. Um, something to keep an eye on. They're they're breaking out, and now what we're going to look for is you know see see if this can base consolidate on the right side and provide a low risk entry. But I wanted to bring this one up because I've seen a lot of uh, apparel clothing names um, doing really well. So maybe China reopening has something to do with this, but. Price price tells you the story. Um, next one is C R O X. Um, this one just continues to rocket higher. I mean, it's when you look at its peers as well. It's best earnings, best relative strength, accumulation, and composite rating. So it's it's the leader in the apparel sector. Um, 
when I mentioned it, we were looking, you know, at that 104 pivot and it, it's had a nice move. So now we, we know it's acting like a leader. So I think con- I continue to monitor, monitor this stock and see if it can build its right base and consolidate for a next move higher. And then last one is F-O-U-R. Um, This one's in the finance credit card payment. Um, So yeah, it was, it was building that right side around that 55 level and it, and it broke out. Um, This is about uh, one of the top stocks in the finance credit card payment sector. I mentioned it on the podcast before, but they do have a little bit of a wild card with the uh, Elon Musk partnership. And then uh, another thing that helped this was uh, MasterCard got an upgrade this week. So the whole sector saw some nice action. So like similar story with all these other ones I named, we're seeing breakouts, we're seeing leaders establish themselves. So let's see if they can consolidate and offer low risk entry points. Good stuff. Uh, one thing that you'll notice that uh, is consistent with all them is it took the market we, we monitor what holds up the best on a relative strength basis, and this is while the market, this black line here, is pulling back. When the market's pulling back and a stock is showing relative strength, either by going sideways or slightly working higher, that immediately goes to the top of our list. And then when the pressure off the market came off uh, late last week, that that's like a basketball underwater, and then you let it go, and the stock takes off along with the market. So. The stocks very often are held back by the market, but a combination of a strong market uh, allowing the stock to ride the coattails because again, 70 to 80% of all stocks will take uh, on the overall tone of the market. And this was a case of uh, the pot being lifted off of this and allowing this one to go higher. Thanks, Connor, nice job. Next up, we got Ted and Ted's got some, bullish stats that he wants to talk about and uh, yep. take it away, Ted. Okay. So as Don mentioned in his segment, um, we're currently rallying again right into the 200-day moving average, and there's a huge battle between the bulls and the bears here. So even with this resilience from the bulls, this could very well just manifest into another bear market rally that falters. However, we've seen many bear market rallies, and this one under the surface um, here's different despite all the negative sentiment on the news. And so this is why we look at what we call mark internals or breath. And what this is, is data derived from the action of the markets that provide guidance to how participation is truly in the price action indexes and of stocks. And so, yeah, Don pulled up the first one I want to talk about. And this is the New York Stock Exchange net highs and lows. And if you were to just glance your eye back at the previous year and then compare it to now, We've made the largest recording of net highs all bear market. And in addition, um, the 50 day I want to make sure I get the right, the highs. right one, Ted. That's, that's, and uh, okay, new highs, new lows yeah, is the one you're this, on. Okay. Yeah, this good. one right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. If you take good. a look at the blue line, that's the 50 day moving average of net highs and lows. We are almost back to neutral into the positive range. And if you're to see where it went from positive to negative, that almost just marked the beginning of the bear market. In the beginning of 2022 so this is definitely a gauge that i am watching we uh team revere is watching and this will be important to continue forward and we want to see net highs expand because that shows that it's not just junk off the bottom rally that it's actually leaders and stocks participating and so don can you go to the nasdaq one it's it's a similar story hey re- real quick ted real quick i did want to i did want to yeah. bring up the fact that that actually dovetails with what Don was looking at earlier. He was talking about how the big, big mega tech stock were yeah. holding down the NASDAQ. But if you look at the equal weighted indices, even on the NASDAQ or the S&P or even the total market index, yeah. those are all going up. And a lot of, so a lot of the yeah. smaller stocks that people aren't paying attention to are actually doing well. It's the big mega caps that are making, mm-hmm. the, giving you the illusion yeah. or the impression that the overall market is worse than it may be right now at the current time. Go ahead, Ted, sorry. Yeah, before I talk about this one, I just wanna make sure that we all know that we are evaluating a bunch of different 
angles and sides of the markets. Like we're we're evaluating the index, like the indexes, equal weighted indexes, um, and then we're looking at breadth as well and the action of the individual stocks, um, as Don talks about in his daily report, the market leaders trend gauge. And so here is the Nasdaq net highs and lows, similar to the New York Stock Exchange one. Um, you've seen the largest recording all bear market, and honestly, like for this chart in particular. The character change has been even greater. Um, in the New York Stock Exchange chart, we had during bear market rallies, we've seen some new highs, but in the NASDAQ, it was almost non existent. And now we're seeing a huge, um, nor- like a huge emergence of breath and stock participation in this exchange. And so, Don, can you go to the percent of stocks above the 200 day for the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ? So just as Don would say, another feather in the cap for the bulls, we're seeing more and more stock participation. Um, looking at this looking at this chart just by itself, the 200 day is hooked up. We have bullish alignment in the moving averages. And if you were to look at this, we'd, you could say that um, we bottomed, not the market in particular, but just this chart in particular, that stocks like that the majority of stocks have bottom and are now participating. And it's a similar story for the NASDAQ chart as well. You can just put it up real quick. Yeah, this pretty much explains why the equal weighted indexes yeah. are. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Is it up? Oh, this is yeah. the S&P one. Yeah, there the NASDAQ is. one. There's a... Okay, perfect. Yeah, and the NASDAQ one looks even stronger. Like you see that we made a higher high in this chart as well. Now we're pulling back to new test it. So we'll just monitor what, what this one does. And if we continue to expand upward, that would be a very positive indication for the, for the overall markets. Um, can you pull up the stage analysis one? It's the one in the email with like a bunch of numbers. So previously, I I had a 15-minute segment months ago about Stan Weinstein's stage analysis. And there is this website that kind of outlines and tracks the, the percent of stocks in the, in the various stages. And so if you were to look at this page here, over 80% of the stocks in the S&P 500 are in stage one and two currently, which means either they're basing, so they discontinue their um, downtrends, or they're actually in uptrends now. Um, and then 60% of stocks in the NASDAQ are in stage one or two. So like Don was saying, we are lagging there, but we are seeing breadth improvement. And then finally, 75% of stocks in the New York Stock Exchange are in stage one and two. And so this just continues to add to the bullish thesis. And then Don, can you pull up the market smith? Before you be, volume versus be, down before, on volume? before you go to that stage analysis, so let me... Yeah. Let, let me uh, verify what I'm about to say. I'm pretty sure I'm right, but I yep. want to know that I'm right. So once you go into a bear market and you're, you're finally bottoming, I'm not saying this is bottom. It may or may not only, yeah. only, yeah. only yeah. behind sight will know. But when you're finally uh, establishing a bottom, almost all the stocks, the majority of stocks are going to be in stage one. Cause most of them are, but there'll be a few that buck the bull market. I mean, bear yeah. market and bounce. But and as you go through it, you'll start getting more in stage two and three as a rally. And then when you get really, really long in the tooth of a bull market, it's a mature bull market. Mm-hmm. Most of the stocks will be in stage three and four. Is that correct? No, stage two. No, your stage two. three is yeah. The top the, the, these are stage these four. stages are not base stages. Yeah. Okay. These are okay. not. These are Weinstein stages, not base stages. So they're not the so same stage thing. Stage one okay. means uptrend. Right. Stage one means uptrend. Stage two means it's kind of slowing down along the top. Stage three means it's rolled over. And stage four is the decline. Is the, Am okay. I right there, Ted? Or, or four is the bottoming base. So two, two between right at two, right uh, before you go into three is really the uh, a topping process. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so stage one is the accumulation basing phase after you've um, suffered a decline. 
Stage two is the uptrend, and that's where you want to be long. Okay. Stage three is when the uptrend starts to falter and slows down, and you get the top topping area. So the 200 day, um, 150 day begins to flatten out, and then stage four is when you officially break down um, below the moving averages and those rollover as well. And that's when you want to be out or do some judicial Got sh- shorting. Got it. Good clarification. Thank you. Yeah. And then I guess I can find the link and then we can attach that if that's possible to where I describe stage analysis in the description. Yeah, we can have um, that. And then so, so here is the market smith, just more breadth indicator supporting the bullish thesis. If you just see on the very right side, the down on volume 10 day moving average completely collapsed and the up on volume 10 day moving average has been has has just been soaring. So that just continues to support our bullish thesis that stocks are participating and then there is there's buyer sentiment here. And folks, by the way, that's why you need measurable I mean if I put my feelings and my emotions on, I just went through a bear 2023 was ugly, stocks got tough. I mean we were down we're down a lot less in the market, but still and it's it doesn't feel right. The market is actually yeah. starting to improve and getting better, but my emotions are still telling me I'm scared. Stay covered up. Yeah, you got to take yeah. the emotion. And out. just like how, yep, yeah. and just like how we're looking at these breath indicators, like to look for a bottom. These indicators were flashing sell signals and red flags when we topped around November 2021. So this is these are used on both sides of the markets. Sure. And then, Don, finally, can you bring up the McC- McClellan summation? I don't think that's it, is it? It's the, it's the one with uh, two lines. There's a... here, here we go. Perfect. And so what this one is, it's it's derived from the McClellan oscillator. And essentially what it is, is it's a running total of advancers and decliners and it nets it out. And right here on the right side, you can see that there's a huge thrust in net advancers. And it's it's pretty extended from its 10 day moving average. And we to look on this two year chart, Nowhere have we seen in the last two years have we had this big of a breadth thrust. Um, so just, again, more evidence that there's there's bullish, bullish sentiment here. And so the bottom line is, for now, this doesn't mean just plunge in. doesn't mean the market completely has bottom. We can start uh, taking some positions, keeping exposure light, especially with the follow through day, latest price action and breadth readings. Um, I think like around 25% personally for me. It's a good area to be like for maximum exposure. And then once those pilot positions have seen good feedback, then I'll start to ramp up position sizing and total exposure and take it day by day and don't FOMO. Always be ready. All right, Ted. Thanks, man. One day at a time, Ted. Yep. Nice job, Ted. And Michael's going to wrap follow up on uh, phase, uh phase two or part two of his uh, presentation from the week. So take it away, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. Um, so I, I just, yeah, f- finishing up from the mailbag last week, um, got into the stable coin and then I thought it'd be helpful. Um, and I'd be interested too in the, uh, in the comments on the, uh, on the podcast for our viewers to give their feedback. And, um, I'm just going to pose a question and I'm sort of a framework to think about crypto. And I'd be interested in the, uh, in the comments and feedback and see um, what opinions um, our, our listeners have. But um, basically the way I think about crypto and I've spoken to friends about this and um, gotten their opinions and no one can really um, give me a, a great, um, they, I'll, I'll pose the question and then get into it. But um, basically the entire case, the use case of a blockchain is um is built around the assumption that a distributed database solves problems and when thinking about the use cases of this distributed ledger um think about what problems in your life it would be solving and then consider whether you'd be willing to pay let's say twenty dollars a month for that service and when i ask friends that who are into the blockchain um 
they, they don't they don't really have a good use case for it or most people wouldn't be willing to pay that and um a blockchain the way it works is that um you you need crypto in order to verify the transactions and the costs of maintaining that that database are very expensive and the only way the blockchain works is if those who maintain the security of the database are compensated so that's that's the use case for or that's why crypto exists to to compensate those who are validating the transactions which is what makes it so expensive and a distributed database is extremely inefficient so you've got to think about sort of problem is the blockchain solving and what exactly do you need a distributed ledger for? Because from my perspective, um, any problem that you find that requires a blockchain could be much more efficiently and easily solved by a centralized database, which, which would be far more efficient and, and less expensive. And um, then just getting into crypto in general, um, in my opinion, unregulated crypto is likely to be banned globally. Um, that's just the way these things usually play out. Um, if there is a cryptocurrency that ends up being a significant currency outside of the banking system, um, as Dan elaborated on last week, it'll it'll be brought within the banking system very quickly because central banks, the last thing they're going to do is willingly give give up control of their money supply. So they're they're not going to let that happen. Um, so if there is one that succeeds, it, it will be brought within the banking system. Um, so I'd like to know um, sort of the arguments against that and and why people are interested in in crypto, aside from the fact that they think um, it's going to go up in price, um, what the what the use cases are and why people would be willing to pay for for that kind of service. Um, so that I just wanted to follow up with that. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a it's a tough argument. You get people all over the place. Is Bitcoin real? Is it add value? Is it a fraud? A scam? It's it's just hard to know. But I know. But I agree with Michael that they, the government, the the U.S. dollar is king. They are not going to let crypto or Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency take down the almighty dollar. And in fact, at some point, they're going to try to do make the crypto dollar. I think they do want a a, a U.S. dollar based on blockchain because they can track every transaction then. That's really the end goal, in, mm. in my opinion. It could, I could be wrong. All right, well, thanks, Michael. Don, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, when, when people talk about uh, blockchain a lot, I guess there's, there's two different approaches. The currency approach... Uh, Bitcoin, of course, but Ethereum, I guess, is designed like to build smart contracts on and uh, uh, applications like that. I, Mike, what from what you know about it, what is the biggest application of blockchain right now outside of people just trying to make money on the individual coins? From a utility standpoint, who's using blockchain to uh, provide a better mousetrap, build a better mousetrap than something that existed prior to it. I think I think that's what the issue is. Um, there's a lot of potential use cases, so they say, but I, I mean, when was the last time anyone bought something with, uh, with a cryptocurrency? I, I don't think it's widely used. Um, there's a lot of we could use it for this, it'll solve this, but I don't know if in, in practice at the moment, any of that is, is being implemented or if it would even be more efficient. So I, I don't I don't have an answer to that. And that's what I'm kind of looking for. I, I haven't, whenever I ask <laughs> friends who are super into a uh, blockchain, what the, uh, what the use case is for it or, or what uh, sort of fundamental value does it have? Um, the, the, the classic argument is, uh, remittance payments and and to transfer money easily and to sort of go out of the banking system but i think um a lot of the appeal is that it's sort of anti-establishment and and people are anti-banks so they feel like they're kind of sticking it to the to the man and the banks by by going against the system and using this blockchain but in terms of real world applications i, I i'm not too sure that there are many at the moment well, the the one the one big application that helps. So the blockchain technology is actually, in my opinion, the thing that has value more so than say Bitcoin or Ethereum or a crypto 
currency itself. The banks are trying to use the blockchain technology for their tra- to be able to tra- trace and track every transaction. So every single transaction now has a, a, a custody chain. You know exactly who had it from the start all the way through the entire life cycle of that transaction or trans- series of transactions to a r- related buy or sell or anything. And so really the banks like it because it's secure, not the cryptocurrency itself, I'm saying. I'm saying they're, try- they're behind the scenes trying to, to flesh out the blockchain to use it for just their regular banking system for security and controls for transactions. Yeah, that that's oh, Connor and I mean, Connor. That, that's that. Zach, go ahead, Mike. I was just gonna say that that's where it. Um, so, in terms of a blockchain, I mean, the whole the whole purpose of the blockchain is so that there's a bunch of uh, different people with the information, and they can all verify the transaction so that it, the the system can't be manipulated or hacked. But in right. that case, it's um, it's decentralized, and in order for these different people to be validating the blockchain, they, it's there's an expense involved. So they, they have to be compensated somehow. And if the banking system were to do it, I mean, they, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be a blockchain because they would just centralize it and they would have their own system. And it'd just be, I guess, some, some digital verification platform. But Got in it. terms of it being this distributed, decentralized ledger, it doesn't really make sense. So the true def the true quote blockchain definition kind of changes. I got it. Okay, that that that's that's actually a good answer right there. I haven't heard quite that that slant on it yet. Connor, did you have something? Connor, or Ted, Connor, or Ted, you guys have any uh, opinions on that, or aware of any real practical use uh, in from an in- industrial standpoint now that uh, blockchain is being used for? No, I don't no, have too much to add. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just have All to right. keep, keep watching the process because they're still working on it. Well, folks, listen, Don, you have anything else? You look like you're about to say something. No, that's it. Hopefully somebody listening here can uh, set us straight about how jaded we are. Hey, yeah, listen. About the li- outlook for yeah, listen, <laughs> if you've got pros or cons on blockchain, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear the arguments. Uh, you know, I've got some clients that absolutely are convinced it's the next thing in the future. and then and, Generally, they tend to be a little bit younger, but not always. My son is only 24, 24. He thinks it's a, a big Ponzi scheme. Bitcoin, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't like it. So you just get answers all over the place. It's really hard to tell. Folks, listen, if you like what you heard, please tell a friend, tell a neighbor. Just send them to revereasset.com in the upper right-hand corner. They can just hit the subscribe button, and this podcast will go right into their inbox every Saturday morning. If you go to YouTube, and just go to Revere, just type in Revere Asset, that's it, Revere Asset, and then hit subscribe, you'll actually get this delivered as soon as Zach posts it. So it's about 11.15-ish, 11.10 uh, Central Time right now as we're recording this and finishing it. Zach will have this post in a couple hours, and it'll be on YouTube. So if you really want it early, you can actually subscribe and get this in your in, in, as soon as it's posted on YouTube rather than waiting till tomorrow morning. You can also, there's a contact button on our website and that'll send an email directly to me and you can ask about uh, uh, how to become a client or if you want a complimentary portfolio view, you just have a question. And you can always email any of us directly at dan at revereasset.com, don at revereasset.com, Michael, Connor, or Ted at revereasset.com. And you can always call us old school at 855 855- real wealth don't forget get to watch don's friday night the big show video that's where he kind of does the market insight video uh kind of week recap of moves we made things we're doing and the state of the markets folks have a wonderful mlk three-day weekend enjoy the holiday and we'll talk to you next week on your money because it's not how much you make in the markets it's how much you can keep